I have Roy Bernheim. He is the co-founder of Tebow Bodywear. And I've used this stuff. Incredible, really comfortable. Uh, Performance-wise, it was great. And I wanted after using, you know, you guys send me some samples. And a lot of times, you know, I love free, but it's not warranting getting on the podcast or the playbook. Mm -hmm. But after using the product myself, I really, when I came here, wanted to meet with you and understand the differences in your business. You know, it's a, it's a crowded, messy space. But, you know, I remember uh, meeting Under Armour early on when I worked with Lee Steinberg and laughing at Under Armour going, yeah, they're going to compete with Nike. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's always room for the best. And wanted to, first of all, talk about your other co-founder who couldn't be here and see one of the biggest questions I get is, how do you pick the right partner? Right. How did you two guys coordinate into this great venture? Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's a big one. And it's something that I think we're, I mean, from my side, I'm always super happy, like still now, a couple years down the line with picking the right partner. And it happened actually for us really in a way that my best friend, my oldest friend, I've known him since we were three years old, still my closest friend. Um, he went to study in a different university than I did and so on, and then met Alan. Um, and he was like, my co-founder now. And he was like, okay, you guys have to talk. Like, just sit down and, you know, go for a beer. Um, and that's what we did. When I was still living in Asia, I was living in Bangkok for a few years. And he was there just visiting. And uh, we actually met at a bar for the first time. It's not a bad place. Yeah, no, it was a great place. The bar was called Game Over. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. But that's where it started. Actually. And so you, when you guys had the first conversation, how did, you know, this great bodywear company come about? Was it from the first conversation about, hey, I got this idea, or how did that conversation go? Actually, it, it didn't. We talked about some startups and fashion things back then, but it was really very casual. He was there traveling. Um, only a couple of years later, when I left my job, when I was working down in Bangkok. Um, what were you doing? I was working at a, at a pretty big company actually back then, uh, building a, a new small department, like a little startup within that company for new brands. Okay. So I was uh, looking for factories everywhere in Asia and I was uh, developing new brands for the space and launching them from uh, Myanmar to Hong Kong. To... Was it in the apparel space still? Or... Um, it wasn't. Wow. It wasn't at all. It was uh, anything but apparel back then. Okay. Um, had some tangents, but it was really from uh, oral care to car care products and so on. Wow. Yeah. And so then a couple of years later, you got back together with Alan. And... Yeah. So then when I when I then moved back to Switzerland, where I'm originally from. Is that where Alan was from as well? Yeah, and he's from there friend, as well. Obviously. Yeah. Um, Alan's from the French side though, so that's why we <laughs> didn't meet before. Yeah. Um, and then we started sitting down together and he was already started selling underwear online and it was going pretty well and that's how we then started meeting up once every two weeks then it became every week and then at some point every day wow and they were like it was really catching fire kind of and we were like okay i think you know we we're onto something and that's where it kind of got more serious or more formal about it yeah so you know in essence alan came up with the idea himself kind of proved the model and then you accelerated it. And how do you guys divide your skill sets? You know, what do you do well? What does he do well? Mm -hmm. Where's your weaknesses? Where are his? Um, so one really great thing, I think what I love about how we work together is that just naturally, it always was clear who's gonna do it. Really? Really, I think there was no, no time where it was like, well, that should be you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or that should be me instead of you. Um, it was always very natural. We never put um, a specific title or a role on us. I think now over the, over the time, we, it kind of has taken its place, of course. But at the beginning, it just gravitated towards our skills. So he's, for example, one of, I mean, he's an amazing guy when it comes to optimizing, constantly optimizing processes, the marketing, all of that. So that's really his big thing. And what's yeah. your specialty? Um, my specialty is I love to work on things that are more mid and long term. Okay. Um, so the things like new products, um, coming up with you know, new markets, how could we look at a new market where we could go into, um, partnerships, uh, collaborations, which is a really, really big part of what we do now as well. 
What about the product itself? Because mm-hmm. I was blown away by the product, right? It, it's just okay. like content. I always say, we can talk about how you amplify things, uh-huh. perpetuate it, monetize it. But in the end, you know, things that are really good mm-hmm. take on a life or energy of its own. And I really think that your product has a life or energy of its own. So who kind of focuses in on the product side of stuff? Thanks. Well, this is really our community. Um, we... That's what also, and it's great that you say that it's all about the product, which it is, we, we think as well. And we believe that the best product is made with the most people having worked on it and working towards a common goal together. And this is where, where this comes in, where it's really, we just listen to what our community likes and we invite them to really voice their opinion. We proactively, we do surveys, we do even on Instagram live stuff, you know, and yeah. ask them for feedback. Um, where they tell us what we should be doing. And, and that's really how... How do you decipher, you know, it's a, a great asset to be able to, you know, really siphon information from our community. Mm-hmm. Um, but does it worry you or how do you qualify the information that you're getting? Because it's still a selective group. Yeah. And you're investing money and time and resources into that group. Do you guys have some sort of qualification process or vetting of... Hey, what do you think of this idea? Everybody loved it on the Instagram Live, yeah. the LinkedIn Live. Yeah, that's but... how it started, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're like, great, well, let's do this. Yeah. So this process, I mean, it, it grew over the over the time now. So by now, we will. It starts from the very start of what category should we go into, which is really we, you know, you make yourself vulnerable and you say, what should we be going into? Yeah. Um, and then all the way down to the really product details, all the details that are in there, like our care label at the back of the underwear, which is something that we didn't think of, but everyone told us it's something, it's really annoying, right? You have your thing in the back of your, yeah. uh, of your underwear and it's itchy. So we developed- You haven't seen the Michael Jordan commercial? Everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. The tagless underwear, man. <laughs> That's the thing. So now we developed this uh, fabric that you can just you know, take off. You can pull it out with just, your hands yeah. and it doesn't itch anymore. So those kind of things. And then once that is done, it's all the way down to pre-orders. So we will only manufacture once we see the demand is really there, which... What do you do with someone that orders something and that doesn't have demand? Do you just send them a notice saying we're not sending this? Well, we will, we will, send, it's, we will send them once it hits a threshold. So they know that it will only send then. Okay. And it will take a bit longer because it's a pre-order. Yeah. So this is, I mean, it's all about communication and making sure that people know if they need to wait a bit longer. But this is only for the pre-orders. This is right. not if you go on our website and you order something, it will come get you in two or three days. Of course. This is more but this is for new products. Side. Yeah. yeah. This is for new products. And people are managing the expectations. It's no big deal. Right. No. Interesting. And this is what we really believe in also now from a sustainability point of view is that we don't want to produce something that's not going to sell. I mean, it's financially not a good idea, but it's also environmentally not a good idea because where will it go? Right. And this has been happening for a long time. But now if we can turn it around and we can actually know before we produce where the demand is, we can then not have any waste and and really produce according to that. What feedback did you get that's most surprising uh, from that process? Like, you know, for example, I did research early on with Major League Baseball on antisocial behavior. And I had this theory that during a close game, there's more antisocial behavior. But in actuality, there's very little antisocial behavior in a close game because people are focused in on the game. Uh-huh. It's when it's like a blowout that people are drinking too much, they, they're bored, they throw a peanut, you know, and, and things start happening. What, what was your biggest surprise from the market research of something that you're like, oh my gosh, you know, we never thought of that? Well, the first one was, and this was really our aha moment uh, before we even knew that it had a name. We didn't know about co-creation back then. We just literally asked questions because we wanted to know. Right. We wanted to know how we could improve this product. product. So the biggest moment was when we sent out the first survey back then, it was a few thousand email addresses and over 40% of the guys replied. Wow. And wow. And, That's either good. I mean, <laughs> I want to know that email list company. That's extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it was our subscribers. It was people that subscribed yeah. to our, okay. um, so it was our community. Yeah. Um, and not only that, but it was also, it was 25 questions 
and over half of those were open-ended questions, something that now we well, probably never do. Right, right, right. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. you don't send 12 open questions like this. Yeah. Uh, and so this was, to me, super surprising. Yeah. That actually the guys wanted to engage in this. And which was encouraging as well. Yeah, yeah. And so now you're at a very challenging place that you're growing. You have an entire world that you can service. You have a line of products to select from, and it's continually expanding as well. What do you see as your next challenge that you have to face? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always a lot of challenges. That's what being an entrepreneur is. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and it's never the one you think it's gonna come. No. Um, so I think a big challenge is to really focus on the things that, that we get right and, and on the market and on the, on the uh, how do you say, on the countries that you see that really appreciate your product and not to get too distracted because you see so many things and you have ideas and opportunities along the way. So it's really to focus. It's interesting because I think as there's a generational learning curve going on, mm -hmm. we're going to start becoming more aware of the enormity of the market. I, I don't think that you know most people realize the enormity of the market. I think our economy has benefited from that lack of knowledge of the enormity of the market that, you know, you can jump from, you know, a hundred million dollar company to a three, four, five billion dollar company with the right capitalization mm -hmm. once you have something that works. And I think when we start realizing, okay, this is an enormous market mm -hmm. and that we have the power as a small company to reach an enormous market but then we have all the other stuff that has to go along with it, like localization, shipping, logistics. And that's the other thing. The also, how mile. quickly do you want to grow? You know, do you want to grow with partners that help you grow financing yep. or not? That's always a, a big question. That is a huge challenge. Yeah. And when you, since you have a partner and a co-founder, Alan, you know, those decisions become more and more difficult as you grow because there's more and more at stake and you two are getting older and growing you're, you know, in your thirties now and things start changing. How do you handle some of those bigger questions of, you know, hey, should we go ahead and expand? Should we take in capital, give up equity? How do you guys discuss those mm. bigger issues? Um, we have a very direct way to talk about things and mm. it's um, usually- a weekly meeting or, I mean, just logistically, a lot of people don't know this. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're always wondering, yeah. like, do you have a set meeting every month? So we have a set meeting, more an operational set meeting, mm -hmm. when we talk about our tasks for the week and our goals for the week. So every um, week. Every week, which are more tactical or more a bit shorter term. And then we do have every three months more of a, a bit of a bigger review where we take um, sometimes a day really to think about, to look back what went right, reflect also personally um, yeah. together um, financially as well, and then plan out for the next few months. So we, we do that on a regular basis. And sometimes when you, when you look at that data, cause you, I mean, I sometimes forget about it, right? When, when you just, you're just looking forward and you're moving forward all the time, you forget to really go into your data and, and look at that. Wow. So here's a curious question. You don't have to answer it, but I'm always curious. Uh, I would never ask this about someone's marriage, but in this case, what's the biggest argument that you and your co-founder ever had? <laughs> That's funny. It's actually, <laughs> yeah, uh, I was called, the, I was called the other partner <laughs> once, but I'm, I'm yeah, it's strictly business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so the biggest argument. Or disagreement or a divergence in your strategies or philosophies. There had to be something over these years that you're like, no, this is going to work. No, this is going to work. Or, so I would love to give you a juicy story about this. That's all right. Uh, but like usually what happens, especially in, in our space, um, where it's direct to consumer and it's digital, uh, usually if there is a moment where we disagree, we try to find a way how to test it. Okay. Um, so we would set up two different ways that we both think could make sense and then see how it reacts. It's so interesting because from the inception, your business model, marketing, distribution, amplification is based off of market feedback. Right. And you've been successful at it. Are there any tips or lessons that you've learned along the way that you can share with the entrepreneurs here about that market feedback and how essential and how you are successful at doing that? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I think one of the, the main things is, is, is not just asking questions for the sake of asking questions or for engagement. I think that happens quite frequently, especially in social media. You know, everybody knows now you need to ask a question <laughs> so you get engagement as well. Yeah. Um, and, and we really try to ask the questions that we can also um, use to get better, to get feedback, to improve. Um, so I think that's something that, that we really try to, to do. Even now, we, we have more experience than maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, we still try to remember that we absolutely don't know everything at all. Um, so it's really trying to have this honest dialogue. If you ask a question and then listen and then assess for yourself, well, is this, can we implement it? Can we not? And if you can, then try to implement it. Last question. Mm -hmm. In the bodywear space, you know, some people it's noisy, crowded. And like I said, the reason you're here is I really think you have a product and a philosophy that's going to work. Um, where do you see the business going, the best opportunity in the bodywear space? Where does it lie? I think the best opportunity is, uh, is direct, having this direct discussion with your customers, Still, with your same partners, business same business model, and even going further where we want to have it on our website where this whole process of demand-based fashion is, is, is a proper process and a tool where people can engage in on a regular basis. So where it's public, super transparent, and it's something that happens on an ongoing basis and people are actually used to developing products. It can be bodywear um, together with others to achieve innovation. Yeah, it's really yeah. an yeah. open source. It is, that's the word, company, right? Right. I it, mean, it's open source fashion. You got it's it. It's yeah, open yeah. source fashion. There you go. Well, we will <laughs> be hearing a lot more about open source fashion as well nice. as Tebow, I promise you, and hopefully as well as you and Alan, <laughs> as long as you two keep the same compromise <laughs> in mind, I think your partnership's very strong. We'll have to bring him on to see what he says about you. Though. Yeah, that'd be, I'd be curious to hear that, <laughs> the right. other side. <laughs> <laughs> this is Dave Meltzer with Roy Bernheim with Tebow. Keep an eye on open source fashion here with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.